It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 284 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday, the 26th of November, 2017. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hello. And today we'll be talking about boiling magma, where you might not expect to find it, a new species of grass that could be a tasty snack, and a supernova that just wouldn't die. But before that, of course, you can help us make this show by going to scienceontop.com slash donate and pledging to support us on Patreon. We greatly appreciate all the help from listeners who contribute. It uh, helps us pay the bills. Now, Lucas, when people think of Antarctica, volcanoes probably aren't the first thing to spring to mind. But the continent is littered with them, and while there hasn't been an eruption for at least 8,000 years, there are signs that... Well, maybe there could be one soon, ish. Yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, there, there. It's not not just you know a little island; it's a freaking big continent. So, like all of the continents, it's it has its fair share of of uh, volcanoes, and there has been a volcanic you know activity in Antarctica, um, you know, in recent times. There's also very recently been um, seismic activity, uh, which has been measured, which is indicative of a, a, a large magma uh, chamber or, or um, a, a, a big hunk of the mantle that's, that's really getting jiggy and trying. It's, it's basically magma moving around. Magma. Sorry, we can't say that word without thinking <laughs> about moving. Magma. So there are signs that this magma is, is moving and that, um, you know, it, it might be preparing to, uh, uh, to release. Now, a big caveat here. Although we've seen these signs before, the very similar signals before certain eruptions, like Pinatubo, for example, it it doesn't always correlate with an eruption. It could well be just a part of the normal uh, process, and it could still be, you know, tens, hundreds, or thousands of years before um, anything actually happens that's of any, you know, particular concern. But this region of of Antarctica, which is called the Murray uh, Murray Birdland. It's uh, it's a very um, you know apparently desolate region of Antarctica, which is which is on the the West Antarctic ice sheet or under the, under the ice sheet, and it has a chain of volcanoes, which are typically forms. Uh, I always think of Hawaii when I think of um, uh, uh, volcano chains, where you've got a plate that is moving over a hot spot. So you you'll find that uh, the the uh, the magma will occasionally break through the plate. It will form a new volcano. Then it will you know after it's released all the pressure that's that's um, it will go dormant for a while or or settle down. And then over time the plate will continue to move in whatever direction it was going. And then next time it goes, it forms a new volcano. And that's basically what's happened in this particular area. And it formed a mountain range, <laughs> which is called. <laughs> the ex- executive committee range. It just sounds. Of course, it is. <laughs> I reckon like, that's a mistake. I it's really like a mountain can't... range that was named by a committee. <laughs> I know. No, I reckon what it is. I reckon I. I totally could see this happening. That in some minute somewhere of some some group that are responsible for providing names for ranges in Antarctica. Yeah. They've put a like a note next to it in the field saying we need to send this to the executive committee to come yep. up with the name yep. for this range. And that's just how that ended up there. Someone's just, yeah, that's entered that in and gone, Not, well, that's a weird I name, checked, but okay. <laughs> yeah. I just checked Wikipedia. It is actually named for the Antarctic Service Executive Committee and individual mountains are named in honour of members of the committee. Well, I, I reject there your reality you and I substitute my own because I think my story is much better. Yeah, <laughs> way more interesting. <laughs> so anyway, you've got this. You've got these volcanoes that are sort of roughly in a straight line that that, that have uh, formed the executive committee range, uh, made up of various volcanoes, uh, which are each independently named after members of the executive committee. Apparently, so. Um, 
that's what you have there. And, and as, uh, you know, the rain, the ages of these volcanoes, you know, range from something like, you know, 13.7 billion, uh, million, not billion. <laughs> it started before <laughs> Earth, uh, million years. Did you have your pinky uh, up to the corner of your mouth when you said that? <laughs> the <laughs> the just just I just million. got a bit excited. It's like, yeah, this is, uh, these volcanoes started forming around the Big Bang. It was roughly sort of that time. Um, no, no, 13.7 million years uh, ago, which is Mount, uh, Oh gosh, I shouldn't have even started to say the name of that. Wayshish. I don't know. Let, yeah. Wayshish. Shish. <laughs> anyway, um, and uh, uh, sorry, that's the the youngest one, which is about a million years old. And so there there are you know there are at least some decent geological records showing how often these things have have gone off. Now, oh, also, and how how much of an impact they've had on the area. There are big um, deposits of of ash that are in the in the ice sheet, in the, you know, from previous uh, eruptions from the area. So that's sort of really useful to get a, a gauge on the type of eruptions that occurred, how devastating they were, did they melt through the ice sheets and so forth. Because the in this particular area, the ice sheet's over a kilometre thick, so it means that um, you know it has to be a massive. A massive volcanic eruption to completely melt through that ice sheet. Yeah. The problem is that even if it doesn't completely melt through the ice sheet, it can melt enough ice to cause a lot of water to move around. And the water, the melted water at the bottom of the ice sheet, basically forms like a. Just think of a slippery slide. You know, you end up with with this uh, uh, this solid mass on top of a very slippery um, surface. So it's able to slide and move around. So there are um, there certainly are concerns that if something like this were to occur, we could end up with, you know, worst case scenario, a, a complete melt through of the ice sheet, which would dump a huge amount of, um, of ice uh, or melted ice water into uh, um, the oceans. And, and that sort of amount would raise sea levels significantly, but it would also dump a huge amount of of fresh water into the oceans. That has impacts on things like the global conveyor, um, which you may have heard about, which which moves heat around the globe in the oceans, um, that could have impacts on on weather around the world. It could uh, cause drought in some areas, and you know, you know dogs would sleep with cats. It's crazy. <laughs> I was so going there. <laughs> <laughs> it, it just you know it could be really really bad, but but that's sort of worst case. But but on a on a less uh, dramatic uh, scale. Uh, it could cause other issues with, uh, uh, with with accelerating ice loss, you know, because you you then end up basically giving your glaciers a bit of a kick up the bus and saying, "Go for it!" Now you you can slide quite, mm. quite happily down the down the mountain like you're in a little toboggan run. So you know that that could be really bad. The other thing about this that was cool is there are, um, as I always love to see, there are, there are multiple. Um, lines of evidence, uh, which 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 it's not just these signals that are coming from the seismographs that were installed back in oh, when was that? I think it was two thousand eleven. I think it was yeah, two thousand seven or two thousand ten. I think ten. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So they they basically they installed some seismic monitoring stations um, in the ice in this area from between uh, two thousand seven and twenty ten, and um, they were. Uh, before this point, we really didn't know much about it because, in terms of earthquakes, we didn't know much about the area and what what its history is like. Because if you think about it, most areas where we know a lot about earthquake, there's been um, there's been human habitation, and and you know, so even if we haven't had seismographs in the area, we've got uh, potentially hundreds or thousands of years worth of local law, which can inform you know archaeologists and 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 um, geologists and so forth about. Um, historical events that then they can match up with what they see in the in the geological record. But in this case, we don't have that because we don't have people living there because it's freaking Antarctica and hey, it's cold. <laughs> so, so seismographs went in there and you know in this period of time. And then what they found was was there there were what they called these seismic swarms uh, in between January and February 2010 and in March 2011. And they were basically a series of small earthquakes. Um, and and they were. Apparently quite unusual because they um, uh, uh, there's all these different types of waves that have been given uh, number designations. So um, if you see a seismograph, what you're actually seeing is is the tracing out of these different waves, which are basically different frequencies of of uh, vibration of of, of um, you know, caused by the, uh, um, the, the by earthquake. the earthquake. So so what they saw here was two different types of waves. 
which is the P wave, which is the primary wave, and the S wave, which is a secondary wave. And apparently they, it indicated that these waves had come from between 25 to 40 kilometres below the Earth's surface. And their epicentre, the, the, the point at which, well, actually, sorry, that's not quite correct. The epicentre has come to mean the point on the Earth's crust under which the earthquake had had um, this centred upon, but that wasn't the original meaning I read recently. It was originally meant where it actually was emanating from under the Earth's surface. So, yep, there's a bit of fact of it for you. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, it, it basically pointed to around 55 kilometres uh, south of this uh, newer, the, mo the most recent volcano that we mentioned before, that Mount West. Just, 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 that one. You have to keep on going back, don't you? <laughs> well, just, 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 just. Um, so whoever it that, is on the is, committee that that is named after is probably show. very offended by your pronunciation of their name. <laughs> or hopefully they're laughing out loud. Yes. Uh, or I, actually more likely they'll never hear this. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that, that's interesting where it was coming from because of course that's one of them. That's the most recent volcano, um, in this chain of, of, uh, of volcanoes that have been formed. So, um, you know, we don't actually know exactly what they are, but there were other, as I say, there were other lines of evidence as well. Uh, there's a, a there's a, a a bump that's been rising in the crust. Now, you know, <laughs> that tends to be a sign, not a good sign. It tends to be a sign of building pressure underneath. Um, you know, think of Mount St Helens, for example. They 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 saw that rising over a period of time before it went in eighty whatever it was that it blew. And funnily enough, I've got ash from Mount St. Helens. It's in my kitchen right now. Yeah, I actually heard the, the spice story rack. about where that... Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> but it's funny you say that. It's actually in a Magi um, Dr. Cube <laughs> container from the 80s. It's the little details. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, and, I, and my dad my dad was down visiting me over the last couple of weeks because we, we were building a new bathroom together, and he told me the story of how he got this ash because he was in Washington at, uh, just after the, the eruption, like not immediately after, but, you know, within a, a, a few weeks or months of the eruption. And he he mentioned that there were, um, there were souvenirs in all of the shops that you could go and get some, you know, Mount St. Helens ash. And he mentioned to the cab driver that was taking him to the airport on the last day that he was there that, oh, he meant to go and get some ash from, from uh, St. Helens to take home, you know, for his kids. And the cab driver goes, oh, no problem. Pulled over, scooped some, he grabbed this little magic container out of his uh, a glove box, scooped some ash out of the, um, out of the, the gutter on the side of the road. Said it's everywhere, oh, man. Wow. You don't need to buy it. <laughs> so, wow. <laughs> and we've had okay. it ever since. So there you go. That's very cool. Well, Penny, there is a huge rock formation in the Saudi Arabian desert that's home to thousands of prehistoric rock and cave paintings. Uh, local Bedouin have known about these petroglyphs for centuries, but it wasn't until 2001 that the authorities and academics were made aware of them. And since then, more than 1,400 panels have been catalogued with around 7,000 animals, including what could be the first known depiction of domesticated dogs. Is that right? Yeah, potentially. So um, it's they're quite interesting art. So there's lots of um, what seem to be dogs, um, hunters who are holding bows and sort of other larger animals that are their prey. And I think what's really interesting about it is some of the dogs seem to be leashed. So they have uh, – there's like lines coming from around their neck or from around, from their bodies going round to the, hun the hunter's waists. So when I looked at pictures of these dogs and the – Yeah, tethered. So, yeah, not like what we would consider a leash necessarily, but um, some, some kind of connection. And they're quite symbolic-looking paintings. Like they don't – you know, they're not photorealistic in the same way that – we would think of as, you know, a painting. And as we've known from when we interviewed um, Lynn Kelly, you know, art doesn't always uh, – how do I say this? Like it, it's not always what it looks like. So to us these could 
these look like hunters and dogs, but I mean, they could be pictures of stars or something else. We just don't. Yeah. So yeah. Not, not, we, we shouldn't take them. We literally. shouldn't take them too it's, literally. And in fact, even yeah. the, um, well, the archaeologist said, look, these lines couldn't, they might not be a physical tether. They could represent the bond mm, between course, yeah. or something like that. So I think that's really, I've always found stuff about dog domestication um, interesting. There were one, they were the first sort of animal to be domesticated, I think, around 15,000 years ago. So if these images are around 8,000 years old, these would be the earliest depictions of, um, of dogs. Apparently the next one that we know of is um, sort of 5,500-year-old art from Egypt. Okay. So it's really interesting. However, to me, I think it's one of those things that without new information, we might be going around in circles forever because obviously we can never know exactly what that picture means, um, which is fine. And I think, we, you know, that's something that we know. Yep. But also the way that it's dated, these rock art is quite hard to date because it's not linked to a specific archaeological site. So the chronology of the cave or, you know, the areas is that Mm. the very earliest paintings we think were from early settlers in Saudi Arabia, about 10,000 years ago, 10,000 years old. This art, so I shouldn't have said paintings, this art is appears to be of women. And then the society moved to a kind of like, you know, hunting society. Mm. That's when Mm -hmm. we think the rock art was about eight and a half thousand years ago. And then you see more pastoral scenes of kind of farming, which is later. But the the dog art has been put there because that's what was going on that we know of at that time, um, culturally and archaeologically. But there's no – it's not like you can carbon date it or anything to find out mm-hmm. when it was done. So it could be a really nostalgic image of people remembering an earlier age. Yeah. Or it's a story that they've had yeah. passed down throughout – you know, yeah, centuries yeah. even. Yeah. Imagine if yeah. it was a proposal, like an idea. Hey, I've got yeah. this idea. No wolves. We could <laughs> yeah. get them, train them. That would be very cool. Let's tie them all to our waists and <laughs> <Sure>. see <Yeah. laughs> what could go wrong. No, they totally won't eat us. I swear they won't. They won't. They're so cute. Well, I mean, it's interesting. There's also, there are, uh, there's another um, paint, there's another art form uh, where they show dogs facing off against wild monkeys i think it is so as in the dogs are also there to protect the Mm. humans in theory we don't know we're just guessing that um but it also suggests that they were used for hunting as well so there's an archer and they would go with the dogs to possibly like we have retrievers now so you shoot something with the bow and arrow and then the dog goes and brings it back to you or something yeah all, all so much guesswork because we've just got one little piece of a jigsaw puzzle. But that's uh, that's archaeology. And actually, Penny, I think there's another archaeology story that you wanted to talk about. Yeah, and this other one jumped out at me because of our interview with Lynn Kelly a couple of months ago. And it's a, it's talking about an ex- excavation of a Neolithic barrow site at a place known as Cat's Brain in the UK. So it's sort of near Stonehenge. Oh, near, I don't know. Everything in Britain is near (laughs) as an Australian. (laughs) Near everything else. Um, What I thought was really interesting is often, like I remember from, oh, you know, various children's books where four plucky English children explore the countryside and find a barrow or whatever to, you know, even the basic, I love that genre or I did love that genre or even just, um, you know, just basic archaeology, you know, archaeology for dummies kinds of books, that they're kind of these barrows, these big mounds were funerary monuments. And it was really interesting to read this excavation. It seems that there's a timber hall um, as part of it, which means it was really a house for the living. And I hadn't thought of it before, but the point that was made is just because you might find human remains in a place doesn't mean that it functioned as a funerary monument or would be seen as a funerary monument. And the example that they gave an analog is churches. Like a lot of British churches to this day will have the remains of, you know, famous people in them, not even just in the graveyard next by, but in them. But they're not seen as these, you know, tombs. They're a church. It's a place for living people to go. They just happen to have, um, 
what's the word? Not burials. A crypt but, you know, or something. Crypt, you know? yeah. So that was interesting to me as well. And the idea, you know, that idea that we often come across is that ancestors are inseparable part of day-to-day life. They're not, you know, yeah, put off in some separate place but are part of the the world, the space of the living. But also this was really interesting to me. Um, apparently the post holes that they can see were quite large at the front indicating that it was probably quite a monumental building with a big kind of facade. But also there was some chalk blocks deposited into the post holes during the construction and they had these chalk blocks. Chalk is a very soft material, had deliberately created depressions and incised lines on them so it looks like i've seen a picture it looks like scratchings and apparently these um chalk pieces are often controversial but i just kept thinking of lynn and i'm sure you know i'm not the first or last to her you know idea that these kinds of things could be those portable mnemonic devices you know handheld devices and yeah you can see how maybe you might that could be very symbolic to put that into a bill you know what i mean like yeah yeah so I just thought that was fascinating. I think the more, you know, the more you know, the more connections you see and, yeah, it's it's such an interesting. With our patent-seeking brain. Yeah, <laughs> our patent-seeking brain. So anyone who hasn't listened to our Lynn Kelly interview, oh, I would to... just highly recommend. Yeah, totally. That was awesome. And I, I listened to um, the Memory Code as an audio. It's available as an audio book from Audible on the way home from uh, a trip recently into state. It was just it was fascinating, absolutely fascinating book. Yeah, I read it because I was like, oh, I better, um, you know, read up for this interview. And I just ploughed through it. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah. I loved it. We'll have a link to uh, that episode yeah. in the show notes. So people should definitely go and listen to it if they didn't. Um, but I just love that every time we explore a, a site like this, is we're again getting just another little snapshot into lives and the cultures of people mm. 6,000 years ago is just always exciting to me. I always go, oh, now what? What are we learning now? It's very I'm ter- I think- Imagine a snapshot yeah. of our houses, though. Oh, God. <laughs> like- <laughs> <laughs> I find a newspaper and it's like they worshipped this god called yeah. Trump and he, wow, that's... <laughs> oh, God. Oh, no. Uh, this yeah. is the room where they kept their Duplo. <laughs> <laughs> they obviously had some deep ritual significance. Yes, like the, the Duplo seems lentils. to be used yes. as a training device for young builders. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's not too far off, Meccano and that. We used to use them. No, yeah. <laughs> well, Lucas, let's talk astronomy for a moment then. And when a star goes supernova... It usually appears to us as a very bright star that hangs around for maybe three or four months. But a newly analysed supernova, for those playing at home, it's IPTF14HLS, has stuck around for more than two years, getting brighter and dimmer throughout that period. It's now at about one one hundredth of its peak brightness, so it appears to be finally fading out. But this is a really unusual phenomenon, and we're not quite sure what's going on, are we? No. <laughs> <laughs> the end. All right, moving on. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is, I mean, again, I, I, the, one of the things I love about astronomy is exactly what I like about um, archaeology and what Penny was just talking about in terms of, the, it's that puzzle, building the puzzle from fragments. It's just so fascinating. Um, and and, and all, of the, all of the things we're able to, to learn about physics and the and the universe around it just just through observation through various waves of light is just 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 stunning to me and and the you know the the processes that we go through to um you know to check our assumptions and to to build our models and and this sort of event is one of those events which can challenge our existing models because when you when you have observations that can be explained by your models. It's it's quite, you know, it's affirming, and you you can move on and go, okay, it's this. And and in the initial stages of the detection of this particular supernova explosion, that's exactly what happened. They detected this explosion of uh, IPTF14 um, and uh, HLS, 
which is just a great name. Um, <laughs> they detected this this uh, explosion, and they felt that the uh, it was a, a very typical Type Two P supernova, which is actually the most common type of uh, supernova that astronomers see. And this is what's caused by uh, this supernova is caused by a star that's sort of over uh, eight times the mass of of our sun. Um, uh, basically, at the at the end of its life, and it will start to uh, uh, to reach a point in temperature where it's it's fusing of its. Uh, of its oh, I won't go into. <laughs> you can look that up, but basically, um, so I love that stuff. But yeah, you can look that up if you're interested. But basically, it's it's a well known and well mapped um, type of supernova. It is the most common one we see. So when when a particular uh, team detected this this supernova. Um, uh, originally, the one of the um, students that was working at, at this observatory took their uh, their observation to the the supervising uh, astronomer um, and said, "Look, you know, is this something we need to look at?" And they've gone, "No, nope, that's pretty boring. We've seen lots of these. Move on." And then the student actually tracked it over a period of time and noticed that the period of dimming did not match what you would expect to see for a type 2p supernova so they took the this information back to um the the lead astronomer and said hey is this is this normal is is there some other type of supernova that explains this and a carver used the the lead astronomer said no <laughs> this this is not normal this this is definitely not normal we probably need to follow this up because there's something very wrong here I like the quote was when she asked, you know, is this normal? Akavi says, absolutely not. That is very strange. Supernova, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah, that, that of course led to, uh, you know, follow up observations. And what they found was that, you know, the typical, um, you know, life period, if you like, of this type of supernova, uh, after about 30 days, they pretty much have dimmed um, quite a lot. So, um, basically, what they found was after 100 days, the supernova looked about 30 days old. After two full years, the supernova's spectrum still, and I'm reading directly, still looked to the way it would be, uh, it would if the explosion were only 60 days old. So the dimming event was very, very slow for this supernova. So obviously, you would start to think, okay, perhaps this is some kind of variable star because you know stars can vary in, in luminosity over a period of time. Maybe we've just got the distance pegged wrong for this. And rather than being a supernova that's hundreds of millions of light years away, perhaps it's actually a variable star that's much much closer to us. So they had to do you know follow up observations, and analyzing spectra, and that sort of thing to to nail down its distance again. And they confirmed, no, it definitely appears to be in a galaxy far far away. So if it were a variable star, it's far too bright to be doing what it's doing. So what we have here is either a device that is new that we've never seen before. A device? I don't Didn't know I why you called it a device, but that was interesting. <laughs> I don't know either. I don't know what do you either. know, I Lucas? I was, <laughs> it's, um, I'm not going to. Yeah, I'm not going to say aliens, but no, what? Um, what we have here is either a star that is acting in a way we've not seen before, or a dying star that's acting in a way we've not seen before. Either way, we haven't seen it before, and to make it even weirder, this freaking star <laughs> is exactly where. A another star that went supernova something like you know sixty years ago in nineteen fifty four. Um, this other star went supernova back then, and this is exactly where that star would be now. Is if uh -huh. if yeah. So it it actually we what we might be seeing here is an event that's been you know sixty years ver uh, uh, variable um, gap between two two other events. So I mean, what the hell? It, we don't know. <laughs> we have no real idea. We don't know. So they said there's there's only so um, so basically if if this was the same star, uh, but, but what they've said is that there's basically a one to five percent chance that that is not the same star because of of exactly the position it's in. It's just it, it's very unlikely that it's not the same star, and it's in a galaxy far far away, and it's got this period of of um, of variable um, brightness. So this is freaking weird, and that's really cool because we love it when that happens because these are the things that help us to improve our models. And, and you know, I, I've talked 
a little bit on the show, but a lot with, with people face to face about models, particularly with, with relation to climate change, mm. because mm. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about how modeling works because people go, well, they're just models. What can, you know, what do they really mean? But the thing is you check models by running them over things that you know. If the models, if you input the data that you know to be true and then you track the model's evolution over a period of time, then after any given period of time, you should get to a point that you knew to be true at that period of time. And that's how climate modeling works. And it's all the same with, with the uh, you know, stellar evolution uh, modeling. Um, they, they're able to look at you know, observations over a period of time. They're able to look at stars in different, different places in the galaxy, different places in the universe, and backtrack and figure out, well, what's the redshift that would occur with, with something this far away? And when they track it all back to, the, to what we know about them, they tend to match up. And this is how we can trust our models. But now we've got something that's going, okay, well, maybe there's a hole in this particular model for some reason with this particular type of supernova. Maybe our assumptions about how this supernova occurs is wrong. Or maybe, oh, man, there's lots of maybes. And I love maybes. <laughs> maybes are wrong. Maybe it's our science. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's either there's a problem with our models and our understanding of supernova or this isn't a supernova and it's something completely different that we've never seen before. Both are exciting and both are intriguing, you know? It's like... Yeah. Look, it, it seems either way, far more likely... It, it seems far more likely, because of the brightness and the fact that it's that's such a, a, a large distance away. Because you remember supernovae can outshine their host galaxy for a small period, usually, you know, a month or so. Um, it's 500 million light years away. Right. It's a freaking long way yeah. away. So it, it's, it's very unlikely just to be a variable star because it's a variable star that's going... Basically going supernova and going, actually, no, I'll just hold that back for 60. <laughs> it's teasing. Uh, just a while. I'm going to go supernova. Yeah. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. No. no. no, I'm not. no, I'm not. no. <laughs> and there are other supernovae that do that. You know, there, there's uh, type 1A supernovae, which, are the, which, which will um, take matter away from a companion, you know, um, red giant. Uh, there'll be a white dwarf in, in a common orbit with a red giant and they'll suck material away from that other star until they reach a certain point that they tip over and they start they start fusion again and that that moment will cause a type 1a supernova so and and they're really cool ones as well because they're a set there are very narrow range of of um of luminosity so they're this is why they're one of the standard candles that we use to figure out distances in the universe so you know it, it there are there are variable and it can happen over and over again so there are variable supernovae but not this type of supernova that with this particular signature we wouldn't expect this to be happening so yeah it's 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 really cool so we don't know what's going on. <laughs> we don't know what they were drawing uh, on the rock art in Saudi Arabian desert. Don't we know. Don't know what was uh, <gasps> the buildings were being built for in the Neolithic monument. But Penny, one thing we do know is that we've just discovered eight new plant species, and one of them tastes like salt and vinegar chips. And I've got to make something very clear for our international audience. We're going to refer to them as chips because we're not barbarians who call them crisps, all right? So we okay. found yep. new species of grass. How do we know that they taste like salt and vinegar chips? And can we mass produce them? I think it's fairly <laughs> obvious how we know that they taste like salt and vinegar because chips. Because scientists... Always so taste their tasted samples. them, even when they say <laughs> they don't, they do. So, yes, they tasted them. I look, I quite like this. I mean, in a way, I'm like, well, who cares? It tastes like salt and vinegar chips, but it's kind of nice that, you know, someone's doing their PhD on spinifex grass and they've found eight new species and they've done genetic analysis and they've shown the different species. And if they hadn't tasted it, look, really, to be honest, no one really would have known. So it's kind of cute. So these... um. Spinifex grasses are really drought-resistant sort of desert grasses. They cover about 30% of the outback. Um, fun fact, did you know that it's farmed commercially in Queensland to manufacture the world's strongest, thinnest condoms? How cool is that? I did not mm -hmm. know that. Yeah. What are those things that makes you think, how did they... How did you know, they... Like a, <laughs> I know this isn't one of the ones that, that you can find an application for a thing in its in its yeah. you know natural state. Yeah. 
you know, but it's like, how do they go, I'm this material might work well for con knobs. Mm, <laughs> I, I, I like the rest of the story is interesting, but I really want to go and research how grass is used in condom manufacturing now. That sounds like a whole nother story to investigate. I think a lot of them can um, make a kind of natural latex. I think um, Indigenous people used to use it to sort of the resin to make glue. Okay. Some species of spin effects. But back to our new <laughs> salt and pepper spin effects. Yeah. yeah, apparently it excretes like a little, little droplets of, um, oh, it's salt and vinegar. Of course, <laughs> salt, salt and, and pepper vinegar is, is delicious. A rap band from the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it um, excretes little bits of salt uh, in sort of droplets, um, which tastes like salt and vinegar. Wow. That's it. <laughs> that's, that's really the whole story there, isn't it? That is the whole story. Like, <laughs> so, yeah. But this, this really links in with, with a story we've done in the past that's, that clearly scientists do actually taste stuff that yeah. they're testing oh, yeah. in the lab. Like there's no other way they would have found this out other than sticking their fingers in their mouth and going, oh, nom, nom, nom. Uh, apparently they did it, quote, unquote, by accident. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they did. I'm sorry, but you that says a lot that. about scientists, that they're out there in the desert doing DNA analysis of grass, and one of them goes, dare you to eat that. Right. <laughs> right, well, that's not what they're doing, like, the, you know, mm, putting the, the um, piece of hay in the mouth and chewing it, you know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but Spinifex is not something I would normally put in my No, mouth. isn't it quite um It's coarse like and quite sort of sharp, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and, and fun, another fun fact, can set your car on fire. Be careful oh. with that, yeah. Mm. Yeah, it gets in like yeah. the exhaust or something, isn't it? And that can- yeah, it can build up under, like in the, in the engine bay and under the the chassis, and and certainly for petrol cars that are running hotter, um, it can they can spontaneously combust. So yeah, it's not not yeah. Don't make sure you sort of get that stuff off before you um, you know go too far. In Australia, even the grass can even kill the you. grass can kill you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um, uh, come for a visit. Lovely place. <laughs> <laughs> come on down to Australia. You might accidentally get killed. <laughs> Scared with little guys. Great yeah, job. yeah. Uh, and I think that's a perfect note to end on. Uh, <laughs> all the stories that we talked about, the links will be in the show notes or you can find them on scienceontop.com slash 284. You can leave us a comment there or on social media. And please, if you can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, that'd be great. Once again, a huge thank you to all our Patreon subscribers. Just go to scienceontop.com slash donate to help us out. Thanks for joining me today, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. This episode was edited while eating salt and vinegar chips by Marcos Benamou. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Red back funnel web blue ring octopus taipan tiger snake add a box jellyfish big shark just waiting for you to go swimming at bondi beach come on come to australia you might accidentally get killed your blood is bound to be spilled with fear your pants will be filled because you might accidentally get killed